Knock has dam damned the UK's diversity drive, which he claims has backfired. Surely it's time to abolish that unwanted inheritance of new labour, the Equality Act. Plus, as speculation continues regarding the Princess of Wales and her well-being, I'll be discussing the privacy of royalty and other public figures. State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by my most pugnacious panel this evening, former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, and the historian and broadcaster, Tessa Dunlop. As always, as you know, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now, it's your favourite part of the day, the news with Polly Middlehurst. So kind, Jacob. Good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB newsroom tonight is passage of the government's flagship Rwanda bill is now delayed until after Easter, when MPs will have to vote on it once again after several votes against it by the House of Lords today. Our political editor, Christopher Hope, has the latest. More trouble here in Parliament, where peers have again frustrated attempts by Rishi Sunak to pass into law his Rwanda plan. It was first announced two years ago by Boris Johnson, but still those flights have not taken off from the UK, carrying illegally arrived migrants to Rwanda. Here in the House of Lords tonight, peers have voted to say that migrants can only be sent to Rwanda when all the measures in the Rwanda Treaty have been satisfied, and that could take a while. Another amendment passed by the, by the peers here says the bill must have due regard for international law. And so the ping-pong process continues, but the government is very clear it will ensure, it will try and force this measure through Parliament to ensure that flights can take off. It rolls on now, probably till after Easter, when we expect another battle between the Commons and the Lords. Christopher Hope. Now, an illegal migrant is in hospital tonight after being stabbed on board a small boat attempting to cross the English Channel today. UK authorities, including Border Force officials and two lifeboats, attended the scene, which happened just before lunchtime today. Officers are now trying to establish exactly what happened. The victim, we understand, has non-life-threatening injuries. The dinghy was one of eight small boats that reached UK shores on the busiest day of Channel crossing so far this year, with a record 450 migrants arriving today alone. That takes the total number of migrants coming into the UK illegally this year to nearly 4,000. As you've been hearing, UK inflation has fallen to the lowest level for almost two and a half years. Official figures show UK inflation for February came in at 3.4%. That's down from 4%. It's a bigger fall than economists forecast. Inflation is now closer to the Bank of England's 2% target and comes ahead of the latest interest rate decision due tomorrow. The government's aim to create a smoke-free generation came one step closer today as the tobacco and vapes bill was debated in the House of Commons. Under the new bill, anyone turning 15 this year or younger will never legally be sold cigarettes. One in five children has tried vaping despite it being illegal for under-18s, while the number of children using vapes has tripled in the last three years. If the bill passes, ministers say smoking rates among those aged 14 to 30 could be near to zero by 2040. That's your latest news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan that QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. The House of Lords has been voting against the government today in the ping-pong of the Rwanda bill. Peers versus the people is never successful for the peers. In 1909, Lloyd George attacked the Dukes when he said that a fully equipped Duke cost as much to keep up as two dreadnoughts, and Dukes are just as great a terror and they last longer. Now we can attack the puffed-up panjandrums of the quangocracy who sneer at the British people and support the people traffickers by their actions and their votes. The Lords, by insisting on their amendments, which have been decisively rejected by the House of Commons, challenge democracy and cause delay. The Rwanda Plan's debut flight was meant to take off nearly two years ago in June 2022, but has been obstructed by the bien pensance those who think they know better than the democratic will of an elected government. 
The original source of the delay was the European Court of Human Rights, which issued a Section 39 order, supposedly some judge dug out of a bar to scribble his signature, and that order effectively blocked deportations. Then, the UK Supreme Court found that Rwanda isn't a safe country, making the Rwanda plan unlawful. Although, bizarrely, it used research from the United Nations, which itself has sent refugees to Rwanda in the past. And it's interesting and noticeable that Baroness Hale of Richmond, the former president of the Supreme Court, who regularly enjoyed ruling against the government in the role as president of the Supreme Court, is now showing her true political colours by voting against the Rwanda plan. Today she was voting against the government again and helping to obstruct democracy. There is a recurring theme here. All sources of resistance to the Rwanda plan are unelected. This policy has become a microcosm of a much broader problem of the erosion of democracy. The most important of the Lord's Amendments is to say that there is a higher authority than Parliament, yet our Constitution is based on the idea of the sovereignty of the British people exercised through the King in Parliament. The unelected officials in the Lords prefer decisions to be made by their unelected chums in the ECHR, not all of whom are judges in a sense that the British understand, rather than trusting to the British people. Democracy must assert itself. I would like the Chief Whip to change Commons business so that we send these proposals back to the House of Lords tomorrow and that we sit if necessary through Easter until the House of Lords backs down. It might teach the bishops a lesson if they have to come and vote against the government on Good Friday. It would be suitably penitential for them. As ever, let me know your thoughts, mailmog at gbnews.com. Well, I'm very pleased to be joined now by a friend of the programme, Fadi Farhat, Senior Legal Consultant specialising in Immigration and Human Rights. Fadi, as always, thank you for, for coming in. You're most welcome. It, it is, to my mind, the constitutional issue where the Lords wishes to see parliamentary sovereignty overruled, which is the basis of our constitution. They want a higher authority to determine whether Parliament can do things. Yes, um, but I would also say that when we talk about parliamentary sovereignty, it's Parliament is sovereign as a whole, and the House of Lords are part of the Houses of Parliament. It is the second chamber. So it is Parliament as a whole that is sovereign. The entire pizza is sovereign, not just one half of the pizza. Yep. And we have a convention for this because the Lords will usually back down and I'm preaching to the choir here because I know you're an expert on the Constitution, but it's the Salisbury Convention, where if a policy is in the manifesto um, of the winning party or the governing party, the House of Lords will give away. What, gives the, what makes the door open here for the Lords is that the Rwanda policy wasn't in the 2019 manifesto. And so they are conducting themselves um, as one would expect in terms of their view as to scrutinising this legislation. Um, that's a... Very interesting point. And the Salisbury Convention is, is highly relevant to manifesto commitments, yes. um, though strictly it only goes as far as the second reading. It doesn't go, go beyond. What I think is interesting here is that that convention's um, a late 1940s convention, and that more recently the House of Lords has tended to allow the Commons to get its way after a go or so. And Lord Anson of Ipswich, when he was voting mm. against the government on the first go-round, was saying that he thought the Lords should back down on the second go. Yes. And where I think the Lords is pushing the conventions at the edges is there were such big majorities in the House of Commons. It is very clearly the will of the Commons to proceed with this. I accept the first vote was fair enough. I didn't want it, but it was fair enough to ask the Commons to think again. The Commons has thought again. Oughtn't this to be the point at which the Lords is backing down? Um, Yes, in terms of stretching the or pushing the yeah. parameters of the convention, yes, I think we've got there. And I think eventually it will pass, um, but thus far they are simply putting in certain... Well, they're doing their job in terms of the scrutiny. Whether we dislike the basis for their scrutiny is a different issue. But for me, this is part of our constitutional makeup, and it is worth reminding that Parliament is sovereign as a whole. And that's absolutely true, and the concept is the king in Parliament, and... Um, that includes the executive within Parliament, which obviously shows we don't have a separation of powers, unlike other, other countries. Um, in terms of the international law, do you think, as other countries have discussed doing this, it is an allowable thing to do in principle before we get on to the question of whether you think Rwanda is safe? Uh, 
that just depends on how you approach international law and our international obligations. The issue here is that the government or parliament is putting forward legislation which makes a factual determination in relation to Rwanda. Uh, Parliament's free to do that, but the problem with factual determinations is that they're susceptible to change. Mm -hmm. And what the Lords want to do is to ensure that should there be a change on the ground, uh, that um, that would not um, be, um, that, that the, the framework would not go through. I mean, it's a bit like, I think, um, if Parliament were to pass the Weather Act 2024, and Section 1 says, every day is a sunny day, that's fair enough, but there's a difference between sovereignty and truth. Not every day will be a sunny day. And so if the factual situation changes, that's where the Lords are putting in certain safeguards. And where I think, well, where I support the government is not in saying absolutely that a country is safe, but in doing this because it ought to be a ministerial decision rather than a judicial decision. Because whether something is safe is actually not a matter of fact, it's a matter of judgment, do you think, considering all the facts that it is safe or not safe? Yes. And you can point points in one direction and in another direction. Yes. And it's the question of who decides. And where I disagreed with the Supreme Court is that they ruled that their judgment was better than a minister's. And that, I think, confuses the role of the judiciary with that of the executive. Yes. And uh, the, the added complication there is, of course, um, there were question marks as to the evidence used and, and and the source of the evidence and how outdated it was or how up-to-date it was. And that's where we have this very sort of complicated um, tension between, between judiciary and ministerial judgments. And that when you get that tension, it is only, and to your point, fair enough point, Parliament as a whole yes. that can determine it. Because um, if the judges and the executive disagree, then Parliament is above both of them and can command both of them. Yes. And that's constitutionally correct. So yes. if you were yourself a peer, what would you be doing at this stage? Would you have voted against today? Or would you think that it's the third time that the Lords should give in? I think that depends on your personal opinion on the subject matter, because if you were against the legislation by, by dint of your personal opinion, then I feel that it would be open to push the parameters of the Salisbury Convention and, 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 and make, make, you know, send it back to the Lords to have a rethink. But I do think that eventually the Lords will have to cave in on it. Um, the only issue is timing and how that falls into place with government expectations. And of course, we're in a general election year. And so it's all sort of um, forming to be a, a nice little storm, as it were. Well, it's why I was saying uh, in, in the Mogalog that I think the chief whip should call us back and say, look, you've got to sit and get this through. That having a three week recess in the middle of all this is extremely unhelpful for the government. And I think most Conservative MPs would be quite happy to vote on it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week, if necessary. Yes, and of course that will be a decision for the whip, and of course um, that's one that perhaps is, is needed if the government wants to reassert its, uh, its uh, sense of control over the matter, especially with local elections around the corner, which I know are slightly different, but all will form and, part and of that balance. Widening the question out a bit on the House of Lords, do you think it's working well as a constitutional settlement at the moment? Because there does seem to be an increased habit of the Lords voting against the Commons, not on um, structure of law, but on the policy of law. And I wonder whether that is really its role or whether it's been since the change that came about really in the Blair years, it's become a more political body. Uh, there's, there's potential um, merit in that in that line of thinking, but that wouldn't undo the Salisbury Convention. So had this underlying policy been in the manifesto, then the Lords wouldn't have had their way there. So one could say that perhaps the government in not including it in its manifesto earlier is putting the cart before the horse in trying to put through something that wasn't um, underpinned by a manifesto commitment. Excellent. Well, I'm glad that you have made the case for manifestos actually saying something important and useful rather than just being spin documents, which they sometimes become. Um, thank you very much, Fadi. Coming up, as inflation reaches a two-and-a-half-year low, all eyes are on the ostriches at the Bank of England, whose heads seem to remain firmly in the sand. Plus, I'll be discussing privacy in public life, especially for the royal family. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Absenteeism. 
and parents whose children miss a week or more of school face increased fines in a government drive to tackle absence. This is another one of those government policies which has done nothing to improve the education of our children. Mm. In fact, since this was originally introduced some 10 years ago, the educational standards for our children, the 11-year-olds who can't read when they go up to primary school, have got worse and worse and worse. So it's not working. So what do they do? They just increase the fine. Like, that may make it work. Most of the parents who get fined are taking their kids up so they can take them on a holiday before the holiday companies push the prices up. Mm. And frankly, as a parent, if I've got a £600 discount on my holiday versus a £60 fine, hmm... I'm mm. going to go for the 60 You'll suffer fine. the fine. Yeah. yeah. Let's not forget the other huge absence that children had uh, recently were, uh, during COVID. Mm. Schools were closed for months and months on end. Online learning was really not making up for that. Mm. So how could... You know, it's very difficult for the government to say it was fine for us to take your kids out of school for, for months, but if you take them off for a few days to go to Disneyland, then you are the worst parent ever and you should be... But also, be it's, it's, it's the pandemic that, that caused some of the problems with absenteeism now Absolutely. because the mental health issues that some of these children now have. And there are tens of thousands of children, they, they call them ghost children, that have simply disappeared from the school register. So it that would be nice. It's, it's really, really scary situation. Um, I'm not seeing that the government is, you know taking great measures Well, to I think that. one of Punishing. their plans is to have a national register, hmm. which, 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 which would help with that. Which would definitely help. But I think it, it's, it's almost... It's, you can't, well, they can't deal with the real problem, so they're going after it's... actually perfectly you know, decent parents who are just taking the odd day off you know, for, to save money, frankly. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Well, the male mogs don't think much of their lordships. We were discussing Rwanda, and Steve says we need to leave the ECHR. We can then make our own decisions without interference. Alan, can the 50 in the lords who voted against the government's Rwanda bill be named and have the party they represent published so that the people know who is not on the country's but political side? Yes, indeed. Look it up on the House of Lords website. You can find the full list of who voted uh, against the government. Phil... The House of Lords no longer has any credibility with ordinary citizens. They are out of touch with reality. And Adam, the so-called Lords oppose the will of the nation's people. They are a common nuisance, anti-democratic, and should be fined for obstruction of justice. Adam, excellent. Yes, you're clear and forthright, like so many of the male mogs are. Keep on sending them in. The inflation figures came in this morning, and the consumer price index has fallen to a two-and-a-half-year low at 3.4%. But the ostriches at the Bank of England have kept their heads firmly in the sand, which means it's time for this. Oh, ostrich, consider how the world we know is trembling on the brink. Have you heard the news? May I hear your views? Will you tell me what you think? The ostrich lifted his head from the sand about her inch or so. You will please excuse, but disturbing news I have no wish to know. Well, you have to decide which one you think is uh, Mr Bailey, the Governor of the Bank of England. But joking aside, the Bank of England continues to be slowest in the class when it comes to monetary policy. It was too slow to increase rates in the post-Covid era, and now it's being much too slow to cut rates as inflation falls. And this means higher borrowing costs for businesses, the government, mortgage holders, those who keep things more expensive for everyone. So what will it take for the bank to learn? I'm joined now by my panel, former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, and the historian and broadcaster, Tessa Dunlop. Um, Kelvin, the Bank of England, 
with political independence, free to do what it likes, seems to get everything wrong. Well, I think one of the issues is has come in from uh, America tonight, in which the Fed have basically said that they intend to cut uh, by three quarters of a percent this year, and that they believe that the situation in America is such that it will be sooner rather than later. Now, we normally end up doing what America does, but about about uh, a month, two months, three months, four months. Afterwards, uh, we're in a cautious situation. I think the time for caution must come to an end. Now, I'm, I am Rishi. I'm saying to myself, the best news that I can put out, I should put out early. And I can't understand why Bailey, who normally follows the political will of the moment, to be truthful, but about six weeks later, doesn't grab hold of it and simply say, look, the signs are all there. The, the rate that this is going will be two percent. Will be two percent by May, right? At which point, the extra quarter percent will be necessary, not not be nice to have. We need to give some good news to our people. Our people have been through. Our nation has been through a shocking, shocking time. And this seems to be the thing the Bank of England misses: um, that inflation is a lagging indicator, and therefore you have to move before you've got the figure, rather than afterwards. Once you're doing it afterwards, you're too late. But we've not hit the optimal 2%. Inflation is still above 3% and food inflation is 5%. And while I understand that when Kelvin's talking about the people looking after the people, you're referring to those with mortgages because they're the ones who are hit. I totally understand. No, no. I'm also included renters, in those. renters through landlord okay. mortgages. But, but there's also a huge number of people who might not have a propensity to vote Conservative who would be extraordinarily badly hit if food inflation ticks up again. Why would we want to jump ahead of America and the central bank, by the way, in Europe? It's not projected to, to reduce inflation rates until the summer and they have a lower... Uh, to reduce interest rates until the summer and they have a lower inflation rate. Theirs is well below the 3%. In fact, they're doing far better than us in Europe. I wonder why that is, Moggy. Well, the, the slow, well, because the European economy has been shot to pieces for years, because the euro doesn't work. That's well, why. There's, there's actually more growth in the eurozone than there currently is in the um, British economy. No, well, not, not in true. Germany not or true. France. No, not, not in Germany. Not in the big actually, no. I'm sorry, in France, their economy is growing at the, a slightly well, faster rate than us. They're both well, sluggish, since, I agree. So, since we basically leave the European Union, we've outgrown both France and, Europe, and, and Germany. So we're doing pretty well on that. But this, to come back to the Bank of England, it seems to me they were slow to increase mm. rates. It's not just they're slow to cut them, um, that many people were saying they should have put them up earlier, including, of course, Andy Haldane, the very distinguished former chief. So what are you proposing? Do you want to claw back control of the Bank of England? Do you resent the independence they have? Even though you strongly believe in sovereignty and having control... What sovereignty? You, the sovereignty? sovereignty, the bank having Is its the, own sovereignty. What, you, what, do, do you not like what that, What earthly Jacob? good does putting another financial civil servant into effectively have an important hand on the lever of our country? I don't believe... Look, I've I've worked, I, I've worked in America, and they have a similar system, really, there. I mean, the, the Fed is an enormously strong person, in fact, stronger, actually, than the Prime Minister, that, uh, the, the, the President. That can't be said over here. Basically, you, you get a failure, um, uh, the Financial Conduct Authority failure in Bailey, and you step in as a place man into the Bank of England. He will do whatever the Prime Minister wants, to be honest. Uh, so, so to answer your question, I think the theory of Bank of England independence is a reasonable one. The mm -hmm. practice of it is that it fails when things are difficult. It's fine when things are easy and you're just cutting rates, but they've absolutely failed but both in the mid 20 teens and then pre and post COVID to get the, the um, interest rate right. Well, they're almost mirroring their government then in terms of the handling of COVID, aren't they? Locked down too late and then put, I mean, it, 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 almost if you're criticising them for reacting too slowly, too little, too late. But I, I'm afraid to say that if the alternative is government having their hands on those financial levers, I would leave it, thank you very I'd much, to the Bank of England. I'd rather people who are accountable to the voters, because then if we get things wrong, the people can decide. Kemi Badenoch, the business secretary today, used the findings of an independent report on diversity and inclusion practice in the workplace to state that they had backfired or were counterproductive. Fortunately, she has the power to change this. The Legatum Institute, which is part of one of the owners of GB News, one of our investors, has just issued an excellent report that points out that the public sector equality duty can be removed for any individual public body by statutory instrument. That is to say, ministerial fiat with a single parliamentary vote. Kemi, the scourge of wokery, 
has it under her personal control to defang the Equality Act. So let's hope she uses it and the next Parliament repeals the whole foolish act. Well, my panel's still with me. And, Tessa, you've actually used the Equality Act. I have. Um, actually, no, because in its current form in 2010, um, when you got the amalgamation of race, disability and sex into the same act. But, yes, I have used Discriminatory Act um, to fight a case against the BBC. I had a protected characteristic. I was pregnant. I was on a rolling contract. And um, they sacked me two weeks after I gave birth. So I sued them and I was able to afford to do that because of my home insurance I was covered for discrimination cases interestingly but I was infuriated because for many years they'd openly told me as a presenter we're not going to use you because you're neither a failed soap star and nor are you um, m um, a minority ethnic for example and I understood that there has to be slippage I live in a hugely diverse city near over 40 percent diverse I'm bright white from Scotland not representing London in any way I was on a London station so I understood that but God, I was angry when finally I had my protected characteristic and I was sacked anyway. <laughs> so, um, Calvin, the, the, everyone's in favour of protecting people from outright discrimination. It's just the Equality Act, the public sector equality duty, leads to all these lunatic um, equality officers and courses and so on that just waste taxpayers' right. in, money. In her, in her, in, in, uh, with Badnock quoting the report, basically pointed out that there had been no examples that they could find where there had been any breakthrough because of these kinds of these kinds of acts. And what we seem to have now, I, I, I don't know, if you go to any hospital, I, uh, I suspect that the diversity aspect um, means that if you're, if you're white, um, that is probably going to be your greatest strength now to try and get a job anywhere. I mean, it is a very odd thing that um, what's happened with the diversity is it's gone the other way, that it is the white minorities, for instance, in a place like London, I suppose, if you go to a hospital in London, where, where what percentage would you likely to find of white medical staff, do you think, Tessa? Right, but... That's because we have to recruit many of our medical staff from overseas because we don't train sufficient numbers, irrespective of their ethnicity or gender or, do you or believe sexual that orientation. The reverse is but true. If or we is could, the reverse but, true? But hang on a minute. In was, fact, but, that, that, that actually, what's happened with diversity is that actually no, everybody no, hires from their own, right? No, no, is, is that, I think is that it's possible? a really bad example is to take a, 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 a medical hospital where predominantly we're recruiting from outside our country, stealing from others. I would You're like not to stealing tell, anything I would like from to, others. Actually, we're giving opportunities to people right. who haven't got opportunities right. in their own land. So okay. let's get that okay. right. Okay, could we just focus the FTSE 100 companies? Okay, guess what percentage of female chairs there are in FTSE 100 companies 2022? Not guess many. Well, uh, 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 Six point seven 6.7%. Guess what percentage of CEOs uh, by the way, are women by the way, of FTSE 100 can I companies? Ask, guess. Guess. Can guess. I just ask Five percent. what percentage actually applied and didn't right. and didn't meet the criteria to do a massively important job. Why could it be that somebody is simply not good enough? It's not because of their sex or their race. They just turn out to be not good enough. What's so interesting is that where the woman was a CEO, there were more collaborative decision-making processes and results tended to be I... better. Now let's just talk about diversity on screen. GB News, of course, a bastion, I think you'll agree, of inclusivity. Um, perhaps, well, they employ you, don't they? They do, but they perhaps but, they don't. But Tessa, I don't care. But you, we well, have, no, you don't, because you're a white man no, and you're sitting we, in the main seat. If we have people oh, on who are interesting, mm. I don't care what mm. their um, characteristic is. I care that we have a programme that people want to watch. And I think that means that we will have people from a huge range of backgrounds because that's what people are interested in seeing. But it's not tokenistic. And that you're on here because you're interesting and you're feisty and you disagree with us, not because we need a lady on. I, and that I seems to be really important. I prefer important. woman to lady, by the way. Just a bit lady. I've never been big on that. Just, just a, Ladies polite. Uh, just a little annotation Ladies there. Ladies polite. Maybe in your circles. I want to go to on-screen representation because it's interesting. On screen, um, not including GB News, but uh, approximately there's about 20% representation of different ethnicities, i.e. non-Caucasian, which is larger than the number of um, minority ethnic um, population in Britain, although they might not have the leading roles, interestingly. But behind 
behind the screens, we do much, much less well. So it is what I call, but, you know, uh, out there parading for the public. But hold on, but that's actually, good. But that's no, good because not that good. is the public. It's, not good. it's the public that no. actually see. But those trends I mean, are the because they're good yeah. and they're capable, okay. not because they're tokenistic. Right, and that's but, so important. But so you're saying they're only good at being um, people from different ethnicities are only no, good at being actors no, no, and presenters. No, they're not good at handy, being chair people, CEOs, handy, handy managers. No, no. When they're stars, when they're stars, you know, if you're a massive rap star or something like that, it, the, the percentage there would be the other way around. Fantastic. People love on stage okay. massive talent. OK, so but, black right, people so, can only be so, rap, right, rap stars. What you're talking at... about is because you haven't got a show, you believe that there is some kind of discrimination. Yes, busy. you do want a show. You spend half your life when we're in the green room no, explaining I'm that you're not being allowed a show. No, it's, Come it's, on, that's, Tessa, that's, tell that, the truth. No, that's absolute rubbish. It's because Kelvin <laughs> always true. says, I can't believe you have you don't have your own show. And I say they wouldn't have me having my own show because I don't represent the right-leaning agenda of this station. No, no. I understand that. We're not talking about my career right now. We're talking well, about... Well, no, no, you were talking about no, it just now. Actually, well, yeah, that was briefly because it fell into the line of fire yeah. regarding the Equality Act. Fair but enough. I just want to focus on the idea in journalism, it's particularly bad for it, press journalism, old-school Fleet Street stuff, something like 2% of journalists are from minority ethnic backgrounds, which explains some of the useless, clumsy language when Meghan first arrived on the scene. Do you remember? She had exotic DNA and this nonsense that would have never been written if well, you'd had properly hold on diverse officers. Hold office. on a second. Meghan, as far as I know, was at the beginning the most loved yeah. of yeah, new, the new entrants to about the royal her. family I've ever seen. If you look at Prince Edward's missus, all she got was a bucket load for being a clapped out DJ on, on, on Capital Radio. <laughs> and today, <laughs> and today she's a star. And Megan, right, has now disappeared off the planet. Well, thank you, thank you to my panel, who uh, may continue this argument in the green room. Um, rent controls have been bunked for the umpteenth time after the SNP's war on landlords has failed. So when will we learn that the free market actually works? And don't forget, we'll be discussing the royal right to privacy. Evening. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Most of England and Wales will be dry and bright after a bit of a dull start. Scotland and Northern Ireland turning wet and increasingly windy tomorrow thanks to this weather system approaching from the Atlantic. We've had this set of weather fronts sitting across us today, made for a pretty damp day for parts of England and Wales. Still a few heavy showers around through the evening, but tending to clear away, most becoming dry through the night until that next band of rain makes for a damp start over the highlands and the west of Northern Ireland on Thursday morning. Could be quite murky across the south tomorrow as well. A lot of mist, a low cloud settling in through the night. So don't be surprised if it's not a little drab first thing on Thursday morning. Could even be some fog patches around. It should steadily clear through the morning. And then most of England and Wales dry and bright. A bit of patchy rain could affect North Wales, Northern England at times, certainly wet in Western Scotland. That rain moving from west to east across Northern Ireland to brightening up perhaps across the far northwest, but it will be windy here, blustery conditions throughout and turning a little colder. Elsewhere, still pretty mild with a bit of brightness in the south. We could easily see those temperatures into the mid-teens once more. We will see the rain trickling further south as we go through the night. Uh, a damp start across parts of the south, that rain perhaps lingering until lunchtime across the southeast. Blustery showers coming in behind, particularly for Scotland and Northern Ireland with some snow on the hills and a colder feel. It is going to turn chillier for all of us to end this week into the weekend. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Well, welcome back. We were talking about ostriches in the Bank of England as well as the Equality Act. And Colin says, Jacob Rees-Mogg, please understand that the British taxpayers do not support the Rwanda debacle because it has bankrupted our country. I'm not sure about that. Jeremy, I think your remarks about the Bank of England are an insult to ostriches. And Derek, it is quite obvious to most people that the problems start at the top. So by pointing Andrew Bailey, a serial failure to run the bank, catastrophic failure, was always the outcome. So thank you for that. In a cost-of-living crisis, the siren voices tempt politicians towards the socialist policy of price controls. The rental market is no exception. One part of the country that tried rent controls is the socialist-run Scotland. Former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon implemented rent caps and eviction bans when she was in charge. But new data have revealed Scottish tenants have faced the highest annual rent growth of the entire United Kingdom. And these data have coincided with a new report from the National Residential Landlords Association, which has claimed the Tories' war on landlords could cost the economy billions of pounds and put tens of thousands out of work. The truth is that landlords' interests are the same as renters. If we make it easier to let property, we'll make rental costs lower. I'm not surprised the SNP doesn't understand this simple tenet of the free market. The Conservative Party really ought to. I'm joined now by contributing editor to Navarra media and renter, Michael Walker. Michael, as always, thank you for coming in. Pleasure. Isn't this one of the areas where we know the free market works? Because if we look at the history of the last 100 years, we brought in rent controls, the private rental sector almost disappeared, we removed them, the private rental sector blossomed and gave people more choice, greater ease to move around the country, move to where the jobs are, and actually it brings rents down because you have more competition. Well, rents didn't come down. So the private rental market sort of, as you say, sort of exploded in the 1980s. They brought in shorthold tenancies or shorthold assured tenancies, whereby you can rent out quite easily and you can kick out your tenant quite easily. Now, before that, um, rents, both in the private sector and in the public sector, took up about 10% of people's incomes, as did mortgage payments. By the end of the 1980s, you're talking 30% of people's incomes. So rents did go up in that period. It wasn't cheaper. Well, there was much greater supply and it was actually possible to rent in the private sector um, and that mortgage rates went up because property prices rose, but proportional to property prices, private accommodation became cheaper and more available. Have you ever rented in the private sector? Yes, I have. Did you... I suppose maybe you're in a different position because I suppose the, the thing that stood out to me there is people don't normally want to rent in the private sector, right? Most people are in the private rental sector because they can't have an alternative. If you ask me, I would prefer to either own a home or rent with the council, where I can pay a, a lower rent, which, you know, is, is more secure. The private rental sector is, is there, I think, really for people who don't have an alternative. Now, on, on rent control... Is that sorry, right? Because lots of people do move jobs around the country, and one of the great things about a flexible rental market is it makes it much easier that you think, will I enjoy working in Manchester, if I've been used to living in London, you rent a property. If it works, you may then buy. If it doesn't work, you come back to London. And lots of people also, for early employment, they think, I've been at university in X, let's try London. And if it doesn't work, and indeed it's hard to afford when you first come to London, um, I'll move somewhere else. And that's a part of the flexibility of the property market, which is a good thing. Well, I mean, you could also have flexibility in council homes, right, if they weren't so in, in short supply. Obviously, at the moment, if you get a council home, you're not likely to leave because there'll be a, a, a waiting list, which is thousands of people long, so you won't get another one. But, I mean, if you're talking about flexibility, so I think it used to be the case that private rental was sort of a bit of a waiting room before you became a homeowner. So you'd do it when you were a student, you'd do it when you are in your first... Um, sort of phases of employment, and then you'd be able to get on the housing ladder. The situation at the moment is that you're stuck in the private rental sector. You know, like myself, I'm in my mid-30s. Yeah. I live with two other guys in their 30s. Now, that would have been very unusual 20 years ago, and now that's the norm. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. But the problem that has been created is by not building enough houses, not by the rental sector. And what worries me with what the government's trying, uh, um, Rental Reform Act and so on, and what's been tried in Scotland, is that instead of tackling the difficult problem 
of planning reform, which is desperately needed to build more properties, more homes for people. They go for something that seems easier and won't actually make any difference. So actually, I'm, I'm pretty much on the same page as you there. I mean, I, I think the issue is uh, the number of homes and their distribution. So the really difficult thing you could do, say in London, to reduce rents, is you've got lots of older couples whose kids have left their home who are now living in very large houses that have got four empty bedrooms. Now, the very difficult thing politically to do would be to tax people based on the value of their property and people might downsize. Now, the very easy thing to do, as you say, is sort of tinker around the edges with these rules. Now, a middle ground, I think, so you don't, you know, really annoy these, these older couples um, and you don't just tinker around the edges, is one, some planning reform, I think, would, wouldn't be bad. Two, I would also fund councils with shed loads of money to build a lot of council homes. There was a period post-war where we were building hundreds of thousands of council homes uh, a year. That's when we had massive supply. That's when rents were low. Well, the Labour MP, Siobhan McDonough, did a calculation that there are, I think, a million homes that you could build on brownfield sites near stations in London that are technically in the Green Belt and therefore they're preserved. This would make a phenomenal difference. And it's really, it seems to me that it's a supply and demand argument. If you increase the supply with demand remaining static but high, prices come down both for um, buying and for rental. And that we've got a very distorted market because we don't build enough. And that if we attack the private rental sector, we distort it even more and actually make it harder for people because they won't be able to rent homes because they'll be taken off the rental market. So, I mean, I think rent control has a role, I think, in providing people with stability. Now, if you have got, you know, there are lots of people now, and this is unusual, sort of historically, you've got lots of people who are raising kids in a private rental home. No, not historically, yeah. everywhere, but history, I, that's not really what the shorthold assured tenancy was designed for. And so if you're raising kids, you've got a school nearby, you don't want to have to leave the, the catchment area, then it's very important for you that you've got some stability there. Now, if you don't know whether your landlord is going to increase rent by 20% year on year, you can't have any stability to raise that family. So I think you do need some form of rent control, but it's not going to work unless you also have a massive attempt to increase supply, because otherwise, as you said, you are going to get those unintended consequences. You, you see, uh, um, I think that there's a um, view of landlords that they want to do bad things when most of them don't. That's not to say there aren't some bad landlords. Of course there are. There's some bad social landlords, let alone private ones. But that most landlords want the stability of a regular income. They don't want um, void periods in their property. And so... With a long-standing tenant, they're willing to accept a slightly lower rent than they could get if they chucked them out and started again, because it's in their long-term interest. I mean, but, but prices do go up. Prices go up in everything. It's not just in, uh, in rentals. I mean, so potentially some landlords will. I mean, from my own experience, we had... Uh, two years ago, they increased our rent by 15% one summer. The following year, they increased it by 15%. Now, the second time they increased it by 15%, we said, OK, but can we have a two-year contract? They said no. And the reason they said no is because they want the opportunity in 12 months' time to, to raise it again. So I think there is this idea that the, the contract between renter and, and, and landlord is one of um, consent, where both parties come together equally and they decide what's mutually beneficial. But really, you've got one side that has a hell of a lot of power, which is the people who own the properties. Remember, they've, also, they've always got the opportunity to sell this, this property. Yeah. And then you've got one side that doesn't. I'd also say, because I know, I know there's a report that the landlord lobby yeah, yeah. are going into overdrive at the moment, and they're saying the, the private rental sector adds £4.5 billion to the economy. Now, I don't understand how that works. If, if landlords built houses, absolutely, yes. But if what you've done is buy a house that already exists and then get someone else to pay a third of their income or 40% of, of their income to pay for your mortgage so that you can sort of have a bit more money in your retirement, that's not adding okay. anything to the economy. That's just transferring money All from right. people who are working from it to, to someone well, who owns a house. We may have to deconstruct their calculation in future. As a <laughs> landlord, um, I wish I had the power that you think I've got, but never mind. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, that was less pugnacious, but the pugnacious panel is back, waiting in the wings to discuss royal privacy rather than the royal privy. Dubes and Co. Weekdays from 6 p.m. Get this right. We all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful. But what do we do about it? Because now uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse. That is the campaign. 
there's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, of course, oh. you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they've committed a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to our conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, because I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay, they show up for work. There's a protection they are owed, beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be, there should be a penalty for that. Oh, for the same reason, you. if You're you obliged to use if you it. Commit, There's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is, no, but there is an offer, because at there the end of the day, like, you, earn it, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you the no, solution. no, it's easy. If you see, it's that's easy, an impossible solution they've created something people. that's kind and easy and beneficial to all, indeed. But it's a good thing for all. Do not abuse it. That simple. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. We've been discussing rent controls, but mail mugs are welcome on the whole programme. And Adam says the Bank of England is not independent. It depends on the government bailing it out to pay for its many errors. Well, there's truth in that. Jeff, Jacob, surely the problem with housing supply lies with architecture. Modern architecture is hideous, which is why there is so much resistance to new builds. Jeff, you are absolutely spot on, and I think the king would agree with you. Um, Alexander, landlords are always keen to screen as much as they can out of renters. Surely this ought to be regulated. And Elizabeth, if the Princess of Wales, who is not a royal princess by birth, wants complete discretion on her operation, it is for her to decide. So uh, uh, Elizabeth has preempted our next discussion because it's the moment you've all been waiting for, the royal privacy discussion. What I really want to discuss this evening is the extent to which the royal family can expect any degree of privacy. While the Princess of Wales has been absent, we ought to trust the fact that she will be back to her duties soon. The King, in spite of his recent cancer diagnosis, has been publicly present with the explicit recognition that his duties have been cut back and has told us what is going on with his health. So the question is, how much privacy can the royals reasonably expect? And certainly no one would expect that their medical records should be spied on in the hospital they've gone into. That seems clearly to be going beyond the pale. But I'm joined now by my panel, former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, and the historian broadcaster, Tessa Dunlop. Kelvin, I really want to discuss this with you, because mm -hmm. in your heyday as editor of The Sun, mm -hmm. there was hardly a story that you wouldn't print, and you were getting incredible royal stories, mm -hmm. um, and privacy didn't seem to rise mm -hmm. at all. Do you think that was fair, or in hindsight, do you think that there ought to have been some control? Well, one of the bizarre aspects of it, that all those stories which were denied um, uh, at the time by the palace, oh, she didn't fall, Diana didn't fall down the stairs, this didn't happen, she didn't have this lover, she didn't have that lover. <laughs> In the end of the day, she ends up writing a book and admits that the whole lot was totally true. So the question really boils down to is what rights do the, does the reader uh, of a 
basically a state-funded organisation, the, fun, the, the funder of a state-funded organisation like the royal family have, and what rights do the other side have? And it's in that balance. Now, what's happened if we then look forward, what, 30-odd years, more than 30 years, uh, to today, th something else has happened. The, the newspapers and its online sites, its online sites, which really matter, right, have been massively cautious about cake, massively cautious, right, correctly so. On the other side, and where the power lies and where the Wild West is, is the, in, uh, the social media mm. have been absolutely terrible, mad, uh, but it is them that have set the agenda which is then folded back, and this is where the royals no longer are in control or they don't have uh, comms advisors around them to say, what is the right thing to do? And they end up with this bizarre situation where they get seen for two minutes at a, at a farm shop, and actually even then that triggers off even more people to say, A, there's a body double, and B, uh, that, that William uh, had, been, uh, had hired an actor to look like him. It is a bizarre world we're in, but we are dominated by the online world. And hasn't the king got it right? I mean, I don't actually look at the online stuff. But you don't hear reports of there being lots of online rumours about the king because... Because we're not he, very interested in him. But we are interested <sighs> in the king. And he said what was wrong with him straight away. He's been pictured uh, in the state Bentley very clearly. It's very obviously him. Nobody can question it. And he's 75. It. And, and it's, 75. it's not such a, a big story. But that's what's interesting is I think there's a few things that's been thrown into light relief in the case of these two illnesses. And one is that the only star power the royal family have, and they need star power because they're based now, they forewent their po political power for popularity, is lies with Kate. Mm. And she is the most important player in the royal family. Bizarrely, although the king is head of state in the most important ceremonial and constitutional role. I think the issue here, two things. One, Kelvin pointing out that the predominantly conservative press have not been the ones to cross the line. It's been driven by social media. But that's because the conservative press depend on the royal family and they need to therefore fall on the side of Kate and look after her because she's clearly vulnerable at the moment. The Wild West, you're under the line aren't necessarily royalists. By the way, there's one other point in addition to that is this, that were the online uh, regulated news providers, you know, whether it's the Sun or the Times or, or the Daily Mail, to cross that line, there would be another penalty to be paid. One from the reader, but actually more importantly, strangely, from the advertiser. The advertiser would not agree to the excesses of the 80s. But does that mean we've got into a position, as we were in over the abdication, that there are some people who know all sorts yeah. of things, mm -hmm. yes. but it also yes. allows yeah. all sorts of nonsense yes. to yeah. be spewed yeah. out, and that yes. the There's a vacuum. mainstream there is a... media is letting us down, and okay, we need... So, so in the mainstream media, they do know what is wrong with Kate. Right. Mm. At, 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 yes. at the kind of senior level, yeah. they will all tell you if they were at a dinner party, mm. whatever, and you would, might even tell them, right, this is what's wrong with Kate. And people who know are really upset when they hear this kind of discussion. So there is the us and them about it. And you yourself and many people probably connected with GB News and beyond in the media are constantly getting, getting uh, WhatsApp saying, what's up? With that. I mean, my, my brother in New Zealand suddenly, suddenly right. says, with da -de -da -de -da. But, and you, so you are correct. But, you are correct. But, but the, the, the frailty of the royal family is that Kate is sublimely good at turning up, and mm. as Hilary Mantel said, she's precision made. She is the kind of, you know, the, the framework, the glamorous framework of monarchy, monarchy, where her weakness lies is her ability to go off script, to talk candidly to the camera, just to, to do an Instagram post holding her phone like that, in a way that Megan could. Megan, do you remember she was on the South African tour? She said, No one's asked me how I'm feeling. But, Thank you for asking me. Yeah. And I'm that afraid. Was, that was awful. But you think mistake. that you're old school, and, and, you see. And, and, you're you know, old school. Do you know I what? Princess I've never Wales heard is like, so much rubbish. Tessa. Princess I mean, Wales is like the late Kate, queen. Kate and is she's as bright as nine months. Yeah, yeah. yeah but we're not very, living. Right. Late queen, we're not living in that era anymore, God, Jacob. You are, but we're not. God bless the Princess of Wales. Um, thank you to my panel. That's all from me. Up next, it's Patrick Christie's. Patrick, what's on your bill of fare this evening? 
Are we importing violent foreign thugs across the channel? I'm also going to be exposing the reality of Muslim prison gangs. Uh, we'll be talking about Ed Miliband. Is he actually a dangerous eco-fanatic that's going to make us all poorer? And has diversity and inclusion made Britain better or worse? Oh, that would be very interesting. Ed Miliband is personally very charming, but he is a dangerous eco-fanatic, so you need to watch him like a hawk. But to, to meet and talk to, he's really a very nice chap, though he probably won't thank me for saying so. Um, your programme, as always, will be absolutely fascinating. I will be back tomorrow at 8 o'clock. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg. This has been State of the Nation. And you are waiting with your breath baited for the news of the weather in Somerset. Let me tell you, exclusively, on this channel, it will be fabulous. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials.